Once you find 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, hold your finger there and also go to Jude. We've been looking in the last few weeks at how our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. The children of Israel saw all that in a real way when they were led with a cloud by day for comfort and the fire by night for warmth. The fire, what a helpful thing and what a hurtful thing a fire can be. Last night at our house, we grilled steaks at our house. We as a collective word used in this case, it was just me. I grilled steaks and the family consumed the steaks. For my family is a consuming family. Fire is helpful when you're grilling, is it not? As long as it stays inside of the grill. Fire can be helpful. I've had fire outside the grill before. I had a grease fire going last night. Nothing like a good fire to help you cook, right? I heard one joke about men grilling. It's the one men time they can offer a burnt offering to the meat gods. A fire can be good. Fire can be bad. Fire control is helpful. Fire out of control, as they see in California right now, is devastating, is it not? Fear, destruction, lives and homes destroyed. We've been looking at how in the scripture, God is called the consuming fire. We looked at how God can rekindle those dry branches of our soul. The Lord knows we need to be rekindled. And we can be rekindled every single week. For some of us, it's every single day and others every single hour. We need the fire of God rekindling our hearts because we can get cold fast. You may have not noticed, but it's fall out there. I love the fall. Do you like the fall? This Saturday is a bonfire bash with Pastor Ryan. He hopes to build a fire. Oh, the young Padawan. He'll do great. Fire. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, if you're there now, look in verses 12 through 15. We looked at this last Sunday morning. The Bible says to the Apostle Paul, Now if any man build upon this foundation, that foundation he has told us previously is the salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only foundation that you can possibly build on that will last. Jesus said it this way in the Gospels. You can build upon sand or you can build upon rock. Jesus is the rock. Everything else is sand, all right? At first, the houses look great until the storms come. Once the storms come, then the foundation is revealed. If you build upon Jesus Christ, the house stands. If you build upon anything else, the house crumbles. That's what Jesus said. Now, Paul says, if any man build upon this foundation, that's the Gospel of Jesus Christ, Build upon it gold, silver, or precious stones. Three things he mentions in the positive light, and followed by three things in the ne negative light, wood, hay, and stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be, help me with those next three words, revealed by fire. And what a fire that will be that day. I take my Bible literally like you ought to as well. I believe there will be a literal fire that day revealed by fire. I don't think it's allegorical or figurative. It's fire that day. And it goes on to say that the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work... Sh and if, any and it if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You see, the fire of God will reveal the eternality or carnality of my present decisions. The fire of God will either reveal that my decisions have been eternal in nature, or, there, or, or the fire will, will reveal that my decisions have been carnal in nature. And that daily we looked at, there will be no excuse. There'll be no suggestions offered as to why, if we unfortunately have things burned up, why they're burned up. Well, Lord, just understand that I couldn't have built gold right there. I could only put wood there because offer oh, some excuse, which we all have excuses. And they're all good ones to us. Children's excuses are great in their minds. Then they voice them to their parents and they're not so great. Students' excuses are tremendous to, until their teacher hears them. It was in high school that one day I got this history class. 
I realized I did not have my homework. I believed and knew in my heart that I had done it the day before. We lived about 45 or 50 minutes away from where we went to school. We drove every day on I-75. As I'm rifling through my history book to find this, this paper that my homework was on, I remembered what had happened that the day before, while I was doing my homework in the car, the windows were open and a piece of paper had been sucked out of the car on my side out the window. It was at that moment as the teacher asked for the homework that I realized which paper it was. J.D., where's your homework? <laughs> well, you're not going to believe this. It blew out the window yesterday about 70 miles an hour. Oh, my dad was driving, so 35 miles an hour. She believed me that day. I don't think I would have believed myself. We all have excuses, but that day there'll be no excuses. You'll have nothing to offer the Lord except humility. Humility in receiving the blessing or humility in the shame and receiving the loss. But just humility. We will bow that day and owe it all to Jesus Christ. But I hope, I pray, I desire that that day you don't have to cower and to be humble with shame. You don't have to have shame that day. You don't have to have suffer loss that day. You don't have to be embarrassed that day. You know why? Because the Bible tells us how what we do can last. It's not a guessing game. The Bible gives us the instruction. It tells us what's going to happen, and then it tells us how to make sure that we build with the right materials. Aren't you glad for a Bible that helps us? Aren't you glad for a Bible that instructs us? Aren't you glad for a Bible that's specific? And tonight, we're going to look in the book of Jude, where Jude gives us four building materials. Book of Jude, right before the last book of the Bible, Revelation, only one chapter. I can draw your attention to verses 17 through 23, where Jude writes these words, But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves sensual, not ha or having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves. Remember what Paul said in Corinthians? Make sure that we build upon this salvation. Or I'm sorry, build upon this foundation. Paul in Philippians says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which work within you both to do and will of His good pleasure. And here Jude says, But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and eternal life, and of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, I pray that you'd help us these next few moments. Lord, help me as I speak, that I'd speak those things that would be true and accurate to your word. Lord, I need your help. I need your spirit for clarity of mind. Lord, I need your spirit to communicate this truth. Lord, there's nothing that I can do apart from you because you said without you, I can do nothing. So Lord, help me tonight. Help me to be a help to the people here, Lord. Help me to be a help to those online. Lord, may we be challenged by your word. Lord, may we not build out of materials that, not, that aren't going to last. Lord, help all those who are listening. That you would quiet our hearts and souls tonight. Let so many things yank and pull at us and attempt to snatch the Word of God out of our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'd bind the devil and his demons. Lord, help those who are online. And I pray that if there's anyone here tonight or in the sound of my voice who's never trusted you as their Savior, that they would not finish the service tonight without trusting you and believing on you. 
Lord, we give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Jude tells us, instructs us, gives us some building up material. Paul left off and he said, there are some things that are good. They're gold and silver and precious stones. He said, there are some things that are bad, wood, hay and stubble. But Paul doesn't go into much further detail in that particular passage. Jude, I believe, builds upon this concept under, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I'm glad I have a Bible that was written by God. It all fits together just like this written by different men across different languages and continents. And here, the Bible just fits just like this. The only book that's divinely inspired. He begins to tell us that there is one way to be building up ourselves, and there's another way that's not the right way. Well, what I'm trying to say is there's only one path in the gold, silver, and precious stones. You can't reinterpret the right way. God's not going to be just okay with however you show up. We live in a time, we live in a society that gives credibility to your own thoughts. Young children are raised, are, are supposed to be raised with just words of affirmation. Good job. Great effort. Way to be there. Now, I think as parents, we ought to affirm our children. Can I have an amen? We ought to encourage them. Amen? The Bible word for that is edification, edifying. We ought to build them up. That includes moms and dads telling them, hey, you did a good job. But sometimes, you may not know this, parents, like I know with my kids, sometimes they don't do a good job. Sometimes they even, heaven forbid, make a mistake. Let's go a little further. Sometimes I make a mistake. I know, honey, we're not so, it's not, not so fast. Wow. We live in a time that the world, society, wants to say whatever answer you came up with, that's good. You tried. Two plus two is five. You know what? Good job. You gave it your best effort. You only missed it by two. Wow. You really gave your effort. Wow, good job. Here's a participation trophy. This means that you were there. This means that your heart was beating. And if we're not careful, we will think that God will give us just a participation trophy. That God will say, oh, thanks for just being saved. Oh, thanks for just being a Christian Man, oh man. Now, does God love us? You better believe it. The Bible is filled with that term. He began to wave. He said, I waves, waving for them to follow me and yelling, this is the right way. This is the right way. That's what he told an interviewer after the race. Del Cabo was right, but only four other runners followed him. The other 124 runners continued on the shortcut and ran a shorter distance and finished the race sooner. Now before I tell you what happened, what would you do if you were the judge of that race? You've clearly marked the course. It is a big deal. NCAA Division II Championship. It's not like it's just a local gig or just a charity run, which those are fine, or a color tour or a paint run. They have all of those. Or a night run or a glow-in-the-dark run. Those are fine. This was a championship for the NCAA Division II, and 124 runners have taken a wrong turn running a shorter distance off a clearly marked path. And what they did was they allowed the abbreviated route to stand. And Mike Del Cabo officially finished 123rd. If my name was Mike Del Cabo that happened to me, I wouldn't be very happy. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be hot under the collar. I trained all this time. I don't know what year he was, if he was a freshman or sophomore or junior or senior. I've ran for years. This wasn't as a championship. It wasn't his first rodeo, if I can. 
All right, he's run these races, he's paced himself, he's trained, and all of a sudden you get to the end and the rules have been changed. Boy, that just grated on us, wouldn't it? It grates on you just hearing about that. How can that be? That's not fair. Give the man a medal. He ran the race. Understand something, Christian. God's not going to change the rules just for you or for me. You can run the race and you can take a shortcut. Look at me. I'm on the shortcut. My path's a whole lot easier than your past. I'm already done. But the great judge, God Almighty, the righteous judge, says there's just one path. You can't choose your own path. He won't just give you a participation trophy. In this passage, we have a contrast. Verse 17 and 18. In 17, he reminds us to remember what the apostles said. And he said that, they said that in the last time, verse 18, there will be mockers who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. If you want to know if you're building with the wrong materials, just see if you're following your own ungodly lusts. That word lust refers to desires. It absolutely can bring about a desire for the wrong and sinful, immoral things, but it's not just there. It's all inclusive. And the fact is we have many desires in our life. We have desires for comfort in our life. And comfort can be good or it can be ungodly if God, if God has called us to something else. And he says, in the last day, there will be many who will just walk after their own ungodly desires. There's going to be people all around who just do what they want to do. Boy, does that not seem familiar? Does that not just ring a bell? In 2020, where people live like they want to live. They do what they want to do without any regard for eternity. Going after their own ways, acting after their own desires, doing what I want to do, acting like I want to act, or just doing what feels natural. I wish, I wish that that comparison was only seen outside of Christianity. I wish that we could just identify that and solely identify that particular action outside of the house of God and the people of God. But my friend, you and I both know that there are Christians who are saved and who have claimed the name of Jesus, but who are just living after their own ungodly lusts, their own ungodly desires, with no regard for what God wants, with no regard for what God has asked, with no regard for the commands and the promises of God. They're just doing what they want to do. What I mean by that is, their marriage is whatever they feel like it should be. We have men who don't love their wives, like themselves. They just love themselves. You can see that with every action that they make, every decision they decide to do. We have wives who, in the marriage, don't try to follow the Lord and follow their husband. They just do what they want to do, their own desires wood, hay, and stubble. We have Christians who have been blessed by God with, with financial blessings and with no regard for what God would have us to do with the finances, but just spend it and save it and invest it just like they feel like they want to do. Their own ungodly desires. If people, Christians, who work in field, and that is their highest priority in their life, is their job. How do you know that? Because the job trumps everything else. Heaven forbid the job would, would, would be skipped, but God can be skipped. Ungodly desires. Parents raising their kids. 
Rather than confront and say, hey, this is wrong. No, you can't say that in my house. No, you'll treat your mother with, with, with respect. It's just easier just to let the kids do whatever they want to do. Their own ungodly desires. Hopes and dreams. Comfort, security, safety. All the things that will tempt us and our own ungodly desires. Someone said it this way, I've learned that if you give a pig and a boy everything they want, you'll get a good pig and a bad boy. One time a mother was preparing pancakes for her sons. Kevin was five and Ryan was three. The boys began to argue over who would get the first pancake. Their mother saw the opportunity for a moral lesson. She responded like a godly mother. Jesus were sitting here. He would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. And Kevin, the five-year-old, promptly turned to his younger brother and said, Ryan, today you be Jesus. <laughs> We've been there before, haven't we? You and I have been there before. Our own ungodly desires. And Jude says, listen, in the last days, they're going to be mockers. They're going to not follow the Spirit of God. And they're, good. they're just going to be identified by following their heart. Where it leads, I will follow. Instead of where he leads, I will follow. Own ungodly desires. So you can work how you want to work. You can live like you want to live. You can act like you want to act. You can respond like you want to respond. And, and don't put yourself in too much discomfort. And, and don't exercise your faith too much. And, and don't be uncomfortable in your life. But understand that Jude tells us those materials are not the right materials. That is wood, hay, and stubble. And that day when those things are being burnt to a crisp. But Lord, I wasn't doing this. You're following your own desires. Lord, I, I sat in church like a good Christian, but you're following your own desires. You see, it's an internal decision, but it's the wrong materials. Friend, fellow Christian, may we be warned about the wrong materials. May we ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. Search me, O oh God. Search me. Lord, show me where my heart has been deceiving me. Show me where I've been putting myself ahead of the things of God and the way of God. You see, you can run the race and you can run the shortcut, but God is not going to change the rewards. He's not going to change the rules. And Jude goes on to tell us the right materials here. Look here, there's four things very quickly and briefly tonight. Verse 20, but ye beloved, building up yourselves, building up yourselves, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. First of all is this, prayer, praying in the Holy Ghost. Prayer is the first one. You see it right there? Praying in the Holy Ghost, prayer. You want some gold, silver, and precious stone? Then spend some time, some Christ-honoring time in prayer. I'm not talking about just at dinner or just before you go to bed, but spend some time in communication with and through and in the Holy Ghost. How can we build this life without the power of prayer? How can our needs be met without the power of prayer? How can we have our faith strengthened and built without the power of prayer in our life? You want to know if you have good gold and silver and precious stones being built? What does your prayer life look like? Or how much time did you spend in prayer yesterday? Yesterday. 24 hours in a day. How much time was spent in prayer? Praying in the Holy Ghost. See, our problem is a prayer problem. It's purposeful prayer. It is powerful prayer. What a privilege that God hears me and I can speak to God because of the grace of Jesus Christ. I can boldly approach the throne of grace. Lord, I'm back again. Lord, you said I'd come back. You said I could ask you for something. I'm back. It's me. But I don't deserve to be here. Lord, I need you. And thankfully our God never says, What? Again? You again? This is the 15th time you've been here the last hour. Come on, speak up what you want, come on. Thankfully, God never responds that way. Aren't you glad he doesn't? Aren't you glad he never says, okay, listen, I am on a schedule. 
I've got lunch coming up. All right, I've got, I've got some things to take care of. There's a storm to calm and, and there's some things. It, listen, so spit it out quick. He never says that now, does he? He never says, well, just take a number. You haven't been saved very long. When you get saved for a while, then you'll get a better number. But right now, you go to the back of the line. You ever say that? No, he doesn't. Because of the Holy Ghost and the power of Jesus Christ, I can boldly approach the throne of grace. Prayer, you want to build upon your life with gold, silver, and precious stones, then you better be praying. If you're not praying, you're not building with the right materials. Praying in the Holy Ghost. He goes beyond this in verse 21. He says this, Keep yourselves in the love of God. Use this word, purposeful and persistent. Not in my strength, but in his love. Jesus said it this way, Here is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. How do we continue in the love of God? Well, thankfully, Jesus answers the question for us. Aren't you glad again for a Bible that's clear? This is what Jesus said, continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. How do you abide in Jesus' love? Keep his commandments. Do what he says. That's what Jesus said. I don't have to say, oh no, am I, am I right inside the line? No, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Lord, how do I listen to you? How do I obey you? The small steps. I'm sensitive to what he wants, doing what God wants, obeying what God instructs, following what God leads, listening to what God says. You see, I continue in God's love as I carry out his commandments. You want to build a good house on top of the strong foundation of Jesus Christ, you first of all have to be praying. And the Holy Ghost. Second of all, you have to be obeying. Obeying the Son of God, Jesus. Obey Him. Continue in His love. Keep in the love. That's what the Bible says, in the love of God. And so as I follow Him, Jesus says, then you know you're in the love of God as you, as you obey. Now, does that mean if I make a mistake that God doesn't love me any longer? Well, of course not. We know that at once from the Father's hand, nothing can pluck us out of that. It's called eternal security. But it does mean that I, like Paul said, am constrained by the love of Christ. The love of Christ constrains me. The love of Christ energizes me. The love of Christ uh, keeps me. And I want to keep myself in the love of Christ. I want to do what Jesus wants me to today. You say, Pastor, how do I know the will of God? Well, most of it's pretty easy. Most of the will of God is pretty easy. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. And then love thy neighbor as thyself. On these hang all the law and the prophets. You want to know what the will of God is? Love God today with every bit of your being. Make Him the priority. Make Him and let Him have the preeminence in your life. You want to know the will of God? Then just stay close to God today. Lord, what do you have for me? Lord, I need your help. Lord, I, I, I'm coming back to you again in your word. Keep yourself in the love of God by obeying Christ's commands. He said things like this. You want to know what it looks like to serve me? Then serve those around you. He said, when you've given one of those a cup of water, it's as if you've given me a cup of water. So an act of service, done in the spirit and the power of God, is like I did it for Jesus. No doubt in my mind that if Jesus Christ walked in the back door, if he walked in the back door and he said, I'm thirsty, can I have a glass of water? That there's not a single person who would jump out of their seat right now to get the Son of God a glass of water. There may be a few fists thrown in the process to be the one to take Jesus a cup of water. Just being honest, right? 
Nobody's, I, don't, I don't think anyone here is going to say, oh, that's all right. Enough people are going, I don't, I don't need to help them. He'll get a cup of water. Are you kidding? I don't care if he has 400 glasses of water. I'll give him one more. Maybe he'll drink out of the one I give him. If he came and said, listen, I need a place to stay tonight. My house is open. Would you not say that? The Son of God walks in the back door. I need, I need a ride over there. Okay, got it. In my vehicle, done. Done. You can have shotgun too. Right? For, for the Savior. Jesus says, you want to serve me and serve those who have needs around you. There's a persistence there. This is not just a, hey, I obeyed God last year. And I hope to again next year. And every year, one time a year, I'm going to obey God. This is great. There's a persistence. Today. Tonight. Tomorrow. In case you, didn't, you forgot, tomorrow is Monday morning. Sometimes Monday morning comes and the love of God is the farthest thing on our minds. Other things are on our minds. Oh no, another week. Ugh. Live for the weekend. Going back to work. Ugh. That's not the persistence in the love of God now, is it? There's two more. If you continue in verse number 21, he says, And looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. There's a perception. There's a perception. You want to build with the right materials, then you're going to have to perceive things and perceive the hand of God. I'm perceiving that God's going to come back soon. Do you perceive that as well? It's not going to be long. It may not be in my lifetime. I hope it's tonight. I hope it's before we get done tonight. Don't you? Go home and I love my house, a blessed house, or go to heaven? Hello? I'll go to heaven. If you don't want to, you can stick around, but not me. Perception. Looking for the mercy. I'm so glad for the mercy of Jesus Christ in my life. I don't get always what I deserve. And beyond that, I get compassion in my life. Answers to prayer. I get blessing upon blessing, wonderful blessing, and God's mercy. But it is a perception. That means that when you have a stinky, rotten, no good, complaining attitude, you're not building with gold, silver, and precious stones. Picture that in the fire. Yeah, let's burn this right here, this rotten attitude. Oh, Lord, you would have had a bad attitude if you'd gone through what I went through. No excuses that day. Oh, Lord, if you had had that driver cut you off, you'd have the same attitude that I had right there. Let's burn that up right there. Oh, Lord, if you had had to deal with that particular waitress, like I had to deal with it, you would have, been, it would have, been, you would have tipped her either, Lord burned up. Perception. Perceive what God is doing all the time. Boy, that, that takes some diligence. That takes some discipline to turn our minds, bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Boy, our minds like to wander. At least mine does. I don't know about you. Does your mind ever wander? Why, does our, why do our minds never wander down the right path? Or is that just me? It goes right to negativity. That's where my mind wants to wander to, right to complaining. That's where my mind wants to wander to. Thankful, thankfully, because of the Spirit of God, He can redirect our path. You want to build with gold, silver, and precious stones. And you've got to perceive the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have to be building the right path. And I'm afraid, because of our attitude, many of us have just built wood hay and stubble. There's one more in this passage. There's prayer. There's persistence. There's perception. Verse 22, there's a priority. Do you see the priority? And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You know what the last thing that Jude brings to us in this build upon our most holy faith, in this building upon the foundation? To be soul conscious. To be soul 
tender. A soul priority ought to be our soul priority. A soul priority ought to be our soul priority. That's where Jude ends. It's about seeing people touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's about seeing lives transformed by the power of God. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about if I get a vacation home or you get the raise and I hope you do and I hope I do. But it's about souls saved by the power of God. See, we print these materials because we have to spend money somehow, right? Of course not. We print them so there's just one more tool that you can help that can help us accomplish this soul priority. So that you can give the gospel to those around you. We print gospel tracts. Why? So we have something else to put in the track racks? No. So that you have something that you can take that hopefully will help you keep this soul tenderness. He says, have compassion. I see the patience in that. And others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, I see the persistence. You pluck their very souls from the flames of hell, standing at the precipice of, of disaster and ruin, grabbing those who would leap into eternal damnation by the very clothes, saying, wait, don't go. Someone said this, if you're going to be fishers of men, you must go where the men are. We recently just put a new sign out in the front of the church. It says things like, join us for church. Sunday morning, Sunday 11 o'clock a.m., Sunday evening 6 o'clock p.m. But that sign is only a tool. If I can, it wouldn't help you if you're going fishing. You take your boat out there and take some uh, fishing line and take some lures and some, maybe some live, some live bait and leave it in your boat, but on your boat put a sign, fish welcome here. You may get a fish to jump in the boat. You may. And if you do, it'll be a great story. I was out on the water. I had a sign out there, big old, big old fish jumped in the boat. How big was it? Well, you know, it was big, it was big. Maybe you're going to have to go down to the stream more than once. Maybe you're going to have to throw a rod and a hook in the water more than once. Years ago, my family went to a fish farm, trout fishing in a fish farm. Easiest fishing I've ever been a part of. They gave you a can of yellow corn that day. They gave us a can of yellow corn. You put two or three kernels on a hook, drop that hook in, and the trout seemed to jump on the hook. We turned over to my brother, my younger brother Aaron. He had grabbed the net and had dipped the net into the water and had about 10 or 12 trout picking them up. My dad about had a heart attack at that moment because you paid by the inch. And they said, if you catch them, you keep them because you cannot throw them back in. They will die brother big old net of fish and somehow my dad talked him back in and not charging us for all those fish my brother wasn't the smartest brother in our family no he's very intelligent not that day it may mean you got to get down and throw the net out a soul priority ought to be our soul priority and if you're not soul conscious if you're, if you're not soul tender then you're not building with the right materials you're building with wood, hay, and stubble. Problem is, we build. We build. All of us are building and have built today. We will build tonight. We will build tomorrow. We will build next week. We cannot help but build. The choice is not if we will build or if we will not build. We will build. The question is, what will we build with? God is a revealer. His fire will reveal. He'll reveal our motives, our mind, our mission. And we'll be either be rewarded or we will face reproach. And Jesus said this in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. 
And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So what are you building with tonight? It will all be revealed. It will all be made manifest. All be declared. I hope in prayer, in scripture, is that you're on the right path, building with gold, silver, precious stones. Prayer, persistence, perception, and priority. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, I ask you to, again, search our hearts. Lord, if we've not been building with the right materials, if we allowed our own desires, our own ungodly lusts, our feelings, our heart to lead us, Lord, then we are wasting, wasting the foundation that you've given to us as Christians. Just a moment. Instruments will play. I ask that God's touched your heart. That you come do business with God. And if God has revealed an area that you've not been building correctly, that you come back to Him. He's merciful, full of compassion. Maybe you've wasted some time. Maybe you've built with some wood, hay, and stubble. But you know what? Tonight, you can begin to build with gold and silver and precious stones. Lord, guide this invitation. May we be honest. Lord, may we be obedient. In Jesus' name, as we stand to our feet, the instrument's already playing. The altar's open. If God touched your heart, would you respond to him? If you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, we'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure. We have folks up here who can be glad to spend some time with you. If you're online, you've never trusted Jesus Christ, there'll be a number. You call us. We'll have someone by the phone. We'd love to talk to you and share how God can take away your sin and save you. I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? He has done so much for me. thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for all the mercy and grace and compassion you've shown to each one of us. Lord, I pray you'd help us to build on the foundation you've given to us with the right materials. Lord, help us not just to build tonight, but tomorrow and this week. Lord, may we go out and be salt and light. May we be faithful servants of you. May we walk worthy of the, of the vocation wherewith we are called. Lord, I pray for all the folks who made decisions, you'd cement those decisions. Lord, they'd be right and true. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.